Hello and welcome to Board Game Bond because I'm Jay Sears and this is the Under the Maple Light Show and today we have a very special guest, Jonathan Gilmore, the designer of Dead of Winter and Dinosaur Island. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Okay, it's great to have you on. And why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I am a board game designer and developer. I've been working in the industry for a little over 10 years now. Um, I've got a bunch of games on market around 30 or so. I've worked on everything from mass market party games to you know, much bigger thematic experiences. Um, and yeah, I, I, I get to design games full time. So I'm incredibly lucky to be able to do that. And you set up some fantastic games out there. So Thank let's you. just... Yeah, well, you, you certainly have, and they're doing extremely well. So let's just explain how the format works. For those who have just clicked on, not quite familiar, we're going to be presenting 10 questions to a guest. But there's a twist. Our guest has no idea what the questions will be. We have no idea what questions will be coming out. That's because we'll be pulling them from this ball. And when we finish with those 10 questions, we have 10 new questions for future guests coming on. So, well, our guests thrive in the meat light. So, will they be a lot bit nervous? But we'll find out as we present 10 questions to our guests. Jonathan, are we ready? I'm I'm ready. I'm excited. Fantastic. So let's dive in for question number one. So what plans do you have for the future? Oh, what plans do I have for the future? Well, I mean, it's it's a big year for me. I'm uh, I'm getting married in September, so I'm really excited for that. Um, I have a couple games that are uh, gearing up for Kickstarter right now. I have one called Making Monsters that should be on in a couple months. And then I've got um, Collab coming out next year. Um, so many plans. Uh I am getting ready for convention season, going to Gen Con and some of those other things. And then, you know, longer term, you know, I am really happy with, you know, working with Maestro Media and continuing to grow the uh, catalog of games that we're doing. Right now I'm doing development on a, uh, a Hello Kitty game and a Smurfs game. And we have, uh, you know, a bunch of other games that we haven't announced yet. So, you know, that that part of the future plans is really exciting for all the all the projects that I get to do there. Um, and then, you know, long-term career-wise, you know, I my kind of five-year plan is that, you know, I'd like to get a little bit more stable um, and a little bit more, um, you know, in bed with a publisher because I'd really like to, you know, start to dial back the number of games that I'm designing at a time and just really put a lot of focus and love into into every single project I'm doing. So that's, that's kind of the bigger overall goal. Well, you're certainly busy. You've got, got a lot going on there. Yeah. 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 It's a, uh, it's a busy time. And, uh, you know, I also have, I have four kids, so that keeps me busy. Um, just not enough time to play games and have fun, but I try to squeeze that in too. <laughs> it's, a, it's a common theme we hear from game designers, isn't it? Uh, spend so much time designing your own games, not enough time to play other people's games at times. <laughs> I I really put a focus on that when I started to do this full time because I I had already once before in my life made a passion a career. I had you know I grew up loving computers and I went into computer science and eventually robotics and I really enjoyed that, but I really got burnt out where I didn't have the passion for the hobby anymore. You know I didn't didn't want to make my own computers. I didn't want to, you know, do programming for fun. And it really killed my passion. So when I considered going, uh, you know, becoming a board game designer full time, I promised myself that I would focus on, you know, hosting a game day every month where I don't play prototypes. You know, I only play published games. And even through the week, you know, once or twice a week with my partner, trying to make sure that I, I play some other published game. And immersing myself in other media too because that's where we get all the inspiration so you know trying to keep up on movies and tvs so i i actually built it where i consider part of my job playing entertainment and absorbing it because i think that's important yes absolutely getting the balance right is key so thank you in that let's move on to question number two john 
was one trying to try and jump in, let's grab this one instead. No problem. So what do you think the next challenge, the big challenge will be for the board game industry? I mean, we're, we're just started getting over some big ones, you know, the, all the shipping and problems that we've had with the pandemic. You know, I, I think the biggest challenge and the thing that we should focus on is trying to make games more accessible and diverse, because I think, I think accessibility is such a big thing that we don't think of a lot of time. Uh, you know, when we're designing games, we don't think of how people with, um, uh, you know, different, um, you know, sets of skills can handle them and different, you know, mental capacities and physical capacities. We don't think about how they interface with our games. And, you know, we definitely don't think of how, you know, as much as we should, we don't think of how important, uh, you know, diversity and representation are in our games. So I think that really should be a focus, you know, in the next few years moving forward and making that, you know, less of a thing that causes outrage or, you know, you know, faults, uh, you know, news and just a thing that every game does because that's that's the way the world is. We live in a you know diverse and creative world, and we should you know, represent that and hear hear more of those voices and see more of those you know faces that don't don't just look like us and sound like us. It's a, a very good point indeed, and also people who perhaps are colorblind or of seeing as well and making games accessible that way also it's a very good point indeed yeah absolutely just across but, the board it's something we can all do better yes yes and let's see let's, and let's hope that things do get better for, for those um, let's move on to number three so, right through them. I, should, I should take longer to answer I need to fill up your format <laughs> you can take as long and as short as you like I'm sure there'll be some uh, provoking questions so what's the most annoying thing when playing a board game with others boy i i think the most annoying thing for me is so i feel like the question is asking something different than what i want to answer um, with others, really, I don't let many things bother me. I know, I know, a lot of gamers get angry if somebody like eats Cheetos and touches their their stuff, or like bends their cards when they're picking them up. I I really don't care about that because you know I bought that game for the experience of spending time with my friends. So like a lot of those petty things just don't bother me because that's that's why I bought it, and it's just a thing. Like my friends are more important than the board games analysis paralysis can be a little bit annoying sometimes. And, you know, I think some games could do a better job of trying to communicate game states. Um, but even then, like, I'm, I'm not one of those people who like needs everybody to take their turns quickly. Cause I'm, I'm playing the board games to spend time with people that I love. So I don't, I don't care if we get 12 games in, in a day or three, it's more about the time spent in the, the conversations. So, I mean, I, I try to be pretty easy going about that stuff. Like, as a designer, weird little things bother me a lot of times, but that's more about the games and the production than it is the people that I'm playing with. Um, I mean, it always bugs me when I, you know, I'm playing a game and, you know, someone's not enjoying it, and that's just because I feel like, you know, I didn't do a good job picking out the game or, you know, I'm, I want the people to enjoy it. Um, little things like I really, um, you know, if I'm playing a game, I, I don't like house rules and I don't, I don't feel like I should house rule things because I feel like it's going to an expensive restaurant and seasoning my food. Like as, as the chef, I want to present the exact experience that I want to present. And when I'm playing somebody else's game, like. I want to get their experience. So it always nags on me when there's like little things that people are like, oh, just house rule it or ignore that rule. And I'm like, no, there was a reason for it. And either they should have they should have thought of that or they put it in there intentionally. So I mean that's that's a little pet peeve and I know it's silly, but I that's I just feel like if I'm paying for a meal, I want it to be correctly seasoned. 
a couple of valid points there. And uh, I've actually, um, you know, I, I don't, how true, I think there's an argument though, we use Dominion as an example where, you know, the game ends when that third deck is gone and there might be an uneven tons. So some people say, well, you have your turn, finish it off in that round. So it's even. Now that can be acceptable because that's a very minor tweak to a rule and it doesn't change much a lot. Uh, but it makes it fair. Whereas if you're changing a complete rule that changes the concept of how a game plays, then that can change the whole gaming experience, can't it? It certainly can, but you know, then then I have to ask myself, was that that the designer's intention? Did they want that sudden end where the players have to, you know, part of the mastery of the game is learning when the game's gonna end and anticipating it. So yeah. Sometimes, sometimes fair and balanced isn't the best thing for a game, and that's. I mean, I love games that are wildly slimy. Uh, uh, Cosmic Encounter is one of my favorite games. I think it's a perfect ten. Like, not, not a thing I would change about it. But that game is such an exquisite example of balance through imbalance. Like, everything's broken in it, and it's great because everything's broken. And I and I don't think like. I, you know, I found with like um, with Dinosaur Island, for example, there's a lot of discussion about the small carnivores not being as good as the large carnivores or the herbivores. And mathematically, they're correct. And it's because we found in testing when they were perfectly mathematically balanced, nobody ever built them. So we had to like kick it out of balance a little bit to get the perception where we wanted it to be. And And I think that's a lot of things that people don't understand about like the art of development is that sometimes you have to unbalance and make things unfair to get the exact experience you're wanting so so i do always ask myself in that situation like yes it feels bad but is there a reason that they did that and like is it going to be better the second time i play it knowing that you know it's going to be a sudden death and and I also like when I'm teaching the game, I try to mention like, oh, as soon as this thing happens, the game ends immediately. And, you know, stress that during the game so people are prepared for it. So sometimes it's just uh, uh, that they didn't do a good job communicating that or the teacher of the game, you know, looked at how the game ends halfway through playing it. And then then it's a surprise and not fun. So I, I would try to look at the underlying information, too. Yeah, it's a very good point indeed. And um, well, thankfully, I play by the rules correctly. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, at the end of the day, you paid for the game. Enjoy it the way you want to. Like, if you if you want to dump a bunch of a one, a bunch of steak sauce on an expensive filet mignon, you certainly can. Like, that's that's not what I want, but maybe that's what you want, and that's okay. Like, as long as everybody at the table is okay with it, and the you know the consent's there, I think it's fine. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like you say, there is about the experience, isn't it? That's about everyone enjoying themselves and having fun. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. So let's move on to question number four, John. All right. That was a great one. It was, and uh, I'm sure there's a few thought-provoking ones still left here. So, so are, are these are these questions submitted by listeners, or do you come up with all of them? So what we did, and this is a good question, actually. So um, I actually did quite a lot of research looking at, and I watched countless, countless Q and A's, and it's the same questions that get asked, and it is boring. So I had to look, not just in the board game industry, but in general, about what were good questions that we could ask, and I changed and tons of them to relate to the board game industry. Um, and I wanted to, I, I kind of mixed by some fluffy questions um, and some tough questions as well. So I tried to get that balance. And some of them were original and from myself. I'm sure I've been influenced by some way. Um, and a lot of them were taken from, from different forums, watching various different Q&A videos, a variety of different resources, and then picking all the best and putting them into one place. So how many how many slips of paper are in there? So we started off with 120, so we're dwindling down. And in our next series, we will then have another 120 brand new first questions. Okay, so you you'll ask all of them. The first series is is 12 episodes of 10 questions each. Absolutely, I love that. 
So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll do a new twist as well next season. So um, it'll be a little bit different and uh, won't actually give it away yet. We'll let people get it. <laughs> so let's uh, read out question number four, John. All right. So what was the most challenging thing for you when you started off? I, I'm i incredibly privileged and lucky. I will not lie one bit. I, you know, I was working in industrial robotics, programming robots. I started designing games because I felt creatively stifled and wanted a hobby where I was making something. And I had just gotten back into modern board gaming after a bit of a break. And um, I started making print and play games. My first game I released as a free print and play. You can still download it on Board Game Geek. It's called Pocket Dungeon. It's a dungeon crawler that's designed to be played during work meetings, and it's disguised as a to-do list. Uh, so you can play it, like, during a boring work meeting. Um, and, you know, that that got nominated for a Golden Geek Award. It didn't win, but, like, that. And it was the most downloaded file that year on BGG. And I was like, oh, this feels really good. So I was like, I'm going to keep making print-and-play games. Like, I'll just work on them until I think they're ready and then put them out as print-and-play. And um, I randomly met Isaac through some friends and, you know, he played Dead of Winter, which I was like maybe a month away from releasing as a print and play game. I was just going to put Dead of Winter out for free on BGG um, because it was always like my ode to zombie movies. And like it, it did the zombie stuff that the other zombie games weren't doing. So I was like, I, you know, I'll just put this out for free. People will print and play it and think it's cool. And he played it, and he you know, he asked me to co-design, and I I was very lucky. My very first game had a huge response. You know, sold extremely well, won a bunch of awards, and that opened a ton of doors. I mean, the hardest part was you know just in to this day, it's still the the social aspect. Like I'm I'm a very introverted person, so I I don't love going to conventions and being around a bunch of people i don't you know love i mean interviews like this where they're more conversational are better and i try to space them out enough so i have time you know to recover between interviews but i mean these are all these are all parts i struggle with just because of mental health issues and other stuff um and pitching to publishers is probably the other hardest most difficult part like i don't i don't love the act of pitching to publishers you know hearing a hundred no's is really hard. And I, I still don't deal with that. I, I love the public feedback and I'll listen to people, um, you know, crap on my games all day long if they want to, but like getting to know from a publisher is always harder for me. Um, so those are, those are kind of some of the difficulties, but like I said, like I've been, I've been very, very lucky. Um, you know, I know I don't want to discredit that some of it is skill, but so much of it is just luck and being in the right place in the part, right time. And that's uh, like most walks of life, isn't it? Sometimes you're in the right place at the right time. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure there's others that have uh, filmed in like that. And, uh, you know, some have been lucky, some haven't. And that's just the way life is. But, uh, yeah. So let's move on to number five. All right, let's get a big one here. Okay. So... This is quite, uh, uh, well, I suppose a little bit controversial, but we'll see. Will GameFound ever be as successful as Kickstarter and providing a platform to release board games? Well, I mean, we're seeing it right now with um, the Gloomhaven campaign. I mean, they're at a million and a half after, what, two or three days? Um, I mean, I, I think so. Like, there's definitely room for two, you know, I, I still adore Chitstarter. I have a lot of friends that work there, you know, and I, I do think that it's a very good platform and they are under their new direction. They're definitely making a lot of the improvements that they should have been making this whole time. Um, I think GameFound has a little bit more of an aggressive edge in that it's really trying to build in like streaming and social platforms you know kickstarter really needs to put in um more combat or more comment uh sorry comment 
moderation, like the, the level of abuse from customers is awful. There's really no way to, you know, handle that. So I think, I think Kickstarter needs to make some steps, but I don't ever see it going away. Like it's still the biggest campaigns just generally like Gloomhaven's at a million and a half, but who knows where it would be if it was on Kickstarter utilizing their existing fan base that's already there because Frosthaven did an enormous amount. I don't even remember. I want to say like 5 million or something like that. But um, So who knows? In in big campaigns like Gloomhaven are going to help pour, pull more people over to GameFound. And I, w I was already using it as a pledge manager. So, that, I mean, it was nice that they launched off that way so that, you know, people... If I had to go sign up for another site, like I don't use GoFundMe because I don't want another crowdfunding account. Yeah, so I mean, they definitely have some battles, but it, I think it'll get there and and rival Kickstarter. But I don't think either one's going to go away. Yeah, absolutely right. And I think there's definitely room for for two. Yeah, and um, yeah, it's a good good platform, and hopefully it will continue to build. Yeah. We'll hopefully see some more more and more board games on there in the future. And and Kickstarter is really up in their features. Like they have a lot of really good stuff in testing right now. You know, um, they're you know they they have their own pledge manager coming out, so that'll be more of a contained ecosystem, just like GameFound is a contained ecosystem. So yeah, I think they'll both continue to grow. Yeah. So choices and some things be good. So like, we'll see what's in the future. Right, moving on to our next question number six, John. So, what influenced you to start designing board games? Well, yeah, I, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but really, it was just you know, I grew up creating a lot of art in high school, I did a lot of traditional art, you know, airbrushing and um painting sandblasting like I, I i you know in high school we don't have majors but i i took as many art classes as i could all my free periods i was in the art room um so i really grew up loving to create things and um i missed that and the more of an adult i became and the more i fell into work and you know the cycle of like going to work and coming home and just recovering I was like, man, I really, I really miss creating stuff. So, so for me, it was just an outlet for me to do something. And I, and at first I was going to make some video games. I was like, well, you know, I already got a programming background. I'll, I'll teach myself, you know, Ruby on Rails or some other like popular at the time programming language. And, you know, I'll just make some web-based games. Um, and I started doing that and it was so much harder than like traditional programming and so many other problems. So I just gave up on that and I was like, well, I'll, I'll try converting a couple of these ideas to board games. So I did that and, and it was just, you know, super rewarding, super fun. You know, I released Pocket Dungeon and it got a lot of positive feedback. So it just kind of set me down that path of creating. And I honestly didn't intend or consider making it a full-time job um you know i i definitely wasn't happy working at the factory but you know i had insurance i had a steady paycheck you know i was doing all right with dead of winter sales but i was like well i can't really give up my full-time job i've got you know kids and a, a partner that i need to have insurance for and then uh the factory found out that i was working someplace else as well on the side, which I wasn't really working. I was doing it in my spare time, but um, they found out I had another source of income and they fired me. And then I was like, well, I guess I'll try doing this full time for a while because I was you know, making enough from dead of winter where it could replace it. And we had just over here passed the um, affordable healthcare act where, you know, purchasing health insurance wasn't that horrible. Um, so I was like, yeah, we'll just try it and see. And then, you know, I never went back. I just started working on more and more games because I had the bandwidth and time to do it. And, you know, leveraging the success I had to try to get lots of things on the market. And yeah, I just stabbed out. So, so it was really just that wanting to be creative and 
and setting boundaries like that was real important too. Well, it certainly paid off for you and uh, with some great successes, John. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for the world. It's the, the best, worst job I've ever had. <laughs> I'm sure many people would love to be in your shoes and uh, do it full time. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm very lucky to be doing it full time. And like I said, I wouldn't trade it. Like even for the downsides and the, the hassle of, you know, living from quarter to quarter, which is like, that's, that's the thing that most people don't realize is like, I only get paid four times a year. So like I have to budget out, you know, three months from each paycheck, which is, I'm not a budgeter. So that's not great. I'm, I'm very much a, a grasshopper and not an ant. So like, you know, I did a paycheck and I'm like, Oh, here's all this stuff that I haven't been able to buy the last three months. Maybe I'll buy some of that. Um, so, you know, those parts are rough. Like there, there's a lot of downsides, but there's so many upsides. Like I, I would not trade it. And, and I think, I think it takes a special kind of person to want to do this full time. I think, I think people want to want to do it full time, but like once they start and realize that like a lot of it is just listening to people be awful about your games. Like, um, it is, it, you know, it's great when I meet fans and stuff too, but a lot of times it's people that are very negative about them and. You know, those things can take a toll on your mental health and, you know, dealing with publishers can take a toll on your mental health. So just like any job, it's, it's got downsides, but absolutely. I think that, you know, I, I know I'm very lucky doing this. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, unfortunately humans are generally negative and that's just the way we're built. And uh, yeah, yeah you, you, you learn to process it. Like it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. And I know most of the time when someone's being very negative, it's, it's something else in their life. It's not that, you know, they, and even if they hate the game, that's fine. Like not, not every game's for everybody. There's games that I don't want to play. So I understand it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's certainly great. Look at a positive mindset and, uh, let's move on to our next question, John. Okay. Yes. Well, seven. another big one here so if there is one thing you would change in the board game industry what would it be and why no i definitely have a list <laughs> I just one this is a real tough one this is this is, this is good You know, I, I would say, I think probably the biggest one, because it would help with a lot of other things is I think we really, really need more creative representation in the industry. I think that, you know, people have to really start having hard talks about, you know, I don't want to say unionization, but some kind of collective where designers are better protected because I think a lot of designers are taken advantage of, especially new and underrepresented designers. Cause I think, I think the bigger issue is, you know, we still have a lot of work to do with making sure that people who are you know, from less, uh, you know, with less privilege are able to access the industry. And we certainly aren't, we're seeing a shift in the number of designers who, you know, aren't, um, you know, traditionally straight white male, we're seeing more and more diverse designers, but there's still a huge inequality there and a huge amount of, uh, you know, blockers for people in, in even things they, when people don't realize how expensive it is to go to conventions and have access to publishers and things like that. So, you know, I think a strong designers or creatives guild or union like they have, you know, over in, um, and they have the really good one over in Germany, you know, in other parts of the world, I think that would really help because, you know, they could do things like, you know, help up and coming designers get to conventions and start, you know, advocating for underrepresented people in the industry and things like that. But I, I think across the board, something like that would very, very much be helpful because, you know, right now the publishers have all the power. Um, 
there's a lot of publishers, you know, that I know and people that I know where publishers just haven't paid royalties or consistently pay royalties late. And when, you know, like I said, when you're living quarter to quarter, like if I, if I don't get paid on time and I get paid a month late, like that's devastating if I don't have, you know, if I didn't have a good quarter of the quarter before, so I have a surplus, then that kind of stuff can ruin us. And I understand that, you know, publishers have their own cash flow problems and, and things like that, but paying their talent should be one of the first things they do. So I, yeah, I think I think it would be great to have something like that just to help across the board with all all the things that are lacking in the industry. Yeah, and certainly picked up uh, uh, an ethical or unethical issue of not paying or paying late, which uh, I'm sure if I was were working for for a bit large organisation, they didn't pay your wage. I think you'd be the be outraged wouldn't they? So. Uh, but no, no different than any industry. If, if somebody's not paying the wage or what you deserve, and what your loyalties, uh, royalties that you're receiving, then well, that's not good at all and under any circumstances. And it it's shocking to me every time. Like it's it's not every publisher, and I don't want to make it sound like it's widespread. It's it's very specific publishers that have you know a history of being problematic. Like you know, I can say like. Dead of Winter with Asmodee is fantastic. Like every quarter, four days before the end of the quarter, I did a, ro- a very, very detailed, like 25 page royalty report with where every set of money went to and why I'm being paid what. And then the payment comes two days before the end of the quarter. With uh, like a lot of people want to talk negatively about Asmodee because we have a, we, and we have an overall. And we should generally have a suspicion of big companies, but like, I think the thing that they don't realize is as Modi does a very good job of taking care of all of their people that they work with. Whereas like small companies that people want to adore, like just routinely will ghost you or not pay you or, you know, make up excuses for it being late. And it's, it's always very shocking to me that those same companies will very vocally complain when somebody else is late with one of their payments. So it's like very, very two faced like that. They'll they'll be like, oh, you know, sorry, we just can't pay you right now. You know, we'll get you when we can. But if if a company did that to them, they would. They would call a lawyer immediately. Well, it could be a thing, uh, not a well run uh, business and uh, we want to have some well run boarding businesses, don't we out there that do things correctly and professionally? Absolutely. So, um, okay, let's move on to our next question, John. So we're on question number eight. So I suppose this is pretty much, I think we'll, we'll kind of skip this question because the question is, what got you into the board game hobby? And we already know that answer, don't we? So <laughs> let's bring out another fresh question. So, great. This one back. So, what's the most unique game mechanism you have come across? I always, I'm delighted every time I see something unique in a game, and and we value that and treasure it. And you know, as soon as as soon as something unique comes out, it's you know replicated and refined, which is great. Like that's. Yeah, you know, one of my favorite things. I'm I, I don't know, I'm just constantly delighted whenever I see a game with a really unique hook. I I remember being at a convention convention and it was like two AM and the, the gaming hall was almost closed and there was like two people sitting in the middle and just quietly, very intensely playing things. And I went over and watched, and they were playing Hanabi, which wasn't out yet or widely available. And I was just amazed at the concept of, like, you know, having these cards that were facing against you and and really, you know, taking a, a very classic format, like it's essentially solitaire, where you don't get to see your cards. Um, and then seeing the refinements of that with, like, the mind. I mean, even though you can see the cards, it changes where the information's hidden in a really unique way. Um, so I think 
that really just any kind of metanet like that tickles me. But I would, ha- I, if I had to pick the absolutely most unique, I would probably have to say Nyctophobia. Um, Catherine Stipple designed it, and um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but it's a it's a game about um, being chased by a serial killer or a killer in the woods, and everybody plays with blackout glasses on where they can't see anything at all. And you have to navigate the board by touch as a player, but the person who's playing the killer can see everything. Um, and I and I think that that mechanic of cutting people off adds like such a rich depth to the game that it's that it's amazing and does such a unique experience that no other game has done. Oh, so it sounds amazing, and um, I'm sure people check that out. <laughs> and, uh... Certainly on a Halloween night, perhaps. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's very great playing that late at night. But yeah, there's there's lots of you know we've seen game mechanisms like you say evolve we, over time. Um, it all and we, we're, we're, I'm sure we'll see some new mechanisms come out in the future. There's always something new and unique that comes out, perhaps being evolved from something else. Um, and it comes to the next new thing, and you know I'm sure we'll see more in the future. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, really, as designers, we're constantly just taking existing things and remixing them and finding creative combinations of things to get the experiences we want. So so it is always exciting. And a lot of new designers think that, like, they've created something original when they, you know, when they design their game. And it's it's really tough to get over that thinking and realize that, like, we're not necessarily creating something original every time but we are creating something special and trying to distance yourself from that and become less precious with it, I think is really important um, and really hard to do. So, I mean, I, I absolutely love whenever anything innovative like that comes across. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure that's a topic for a different discussion on Richard and I, if there's a unique and what that actually means. Yeah. So let's move on to our next question on the question nine. So do you feel we have reached the board game ticking, tipping point and it can't get any bigger? So do you think we've gone as big as we can grow or do you think we can grow even bigger? No, I mean, the, the, the industry has continued to grow for six years now i've heard about people talking about the bubble popping and it didn't happen during the pandemic if anything the industry got stronger you know we really got hit by the shipping crisis and you know lost some smaller companies for sure um and we probably haven't seen the end of those losses but i mean i it's just going to continue to grow like we we're not as big as the video game industry yet and i don't know if we ever will be but i think that that growing to that level isn't unimaginable and the, the video game industry is still seeing growth like they're they haven't stopped growing and they've been making products you know for a very long time and growing to be much bigger than the board game industry so so i don't think we're anything anywhere near that tipping point i think we're near a tipping point of publishers not making games as cheaply as they have been traditionally and you know we're not only seeing that the rise of all the prices for manufacturing, but we're also seeing a rise in the multiplier of the value of like pricing a game. You know, usually you do like a certain multiplier of the landed cost. So if a game costs $10 to manufacture and you're doing a 7S multiplier, then the MSRP is going to be $70 because you know, you have to sell to distribution at 50% of that. So you're only making $25 per game so that they can sell it to your friendly local game store at 75%. So you can buy it for that full amount and everybody makes money along the way. But I think it really started when the legacy games got big. I remember people arguing about risk legacy that they weren't going to pay $50 for a game that they should only play 15 times. And at that moment, I was like, this is ridiculous that an adult doesn't want to pay $50 for 30 hours of entertainment because a movie ticket 
costs fifteen dollars for an hour and a half of entertainment, and you cannot get that same value from a movie and a video game. You know, cost eighty dollars for you know twenty to thirty hours of game. Like we we are on we are in a golden age of underpaying for board games that I think is going to disappear more and more. Like we we are seeing prices creep up because of the cost of goods, but I think beyond that we're gonna see prices creep up because people are starting to realize the value of what they're buying. And publishers understand the value of what they have. It's certainly a, an interesting viewpoint, and I, I'm sure as well you'll agree. There may be some people that disagree, John. So it'd be interesting to, see, to hear what other people think. So yeah, for, uh, maybe get involved and leave a comment in below to see what their thoughts are. And as somebody who buys a lot of board games and is a board game fan, I don't want to see that happen, but I also understand why it would. So. Yeah, I, I understand both sides of it quite a bit. Absolutely. And there's always <laughs> games on sale as well. If people don't have to pay the full price, we touch on sale. There's always games that are on sale. Oh, absolutely. And that's, that's the way the video game industry works, right? It comes out and it's $80, and then after three or four months, it goes down in price. And yeah, I, I, think, I think we'll probably see more pricing like that. But I, I could be wrong. We'll see. Yeah, we, we will see in that. Uh... I'm always one for leaking the foot out for a bargain. So, <laughs> absolutely. Let's move on to a final question, John. No, oh, boy. Number 10. When I did, well, I was going to say, when I did fluffy questions as such. So, this is a nice one. This is a fluffy one. Let's, let's finish with a, with a lovely one. So, which game designer would you most likely have a gaming session with? Oh, I mean, uh, again, I'm very lucky. Like, I, I go to Gathering of Friends, so I get to da play games with tons of game designers. Um, so, I mean, I love gaming with Eric Lane. He's fantastic. Um, it's it's always a delight when I get to uh, game with Friedman Fries. He's amazing and such a, a unique personality. Um, so, most likely, I mean, really, any of them. Um, and you know, I also am friends with a lot of designers locally. So I, I would say I oddly get to play a very high percentage of my games with other designers. Um, I mean, I would love to travel back in time and play games with Sid Saxon. He's one of my favorite designers. Um, if we're talking more of like a wish list of people that I would game with, um, you know, someday I would love to play a game with Vitale Lacerda. And uh, Uwe Rosenberg, I absolutely adore both of them as designers. So they're on my like wish list. Vlada Shavado, I would love to play games with because he's I've met him but never played a game with him. Well, hopefully they'll be watching this, don't get in touch. <laughs> hopefully. But I'm sure many people love to sit there around the table and play a game with uh, those that you've mentioned. So that brings us to the end of this show. So we hope you've enjoyed this and you've been watching uh, Board Game Lockers under the Big Light Show. And if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to the channel and like that uh, button. Well, I was going to say like that button. You need to hit that like button. And leave a comment down below as well. Let us know your thoughts on today's show and in particular highlights. But perhaps there's some questions you'd like us to ask guests in the chat. shop. Whatever it might be, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this. My name's Jay Sears and you've been watching Under the Maple Light Show. Thanks so much for our guest, John. Until next time, take care.